we're here at uh, 3.30. It's time for the history of the Sonic Comics panel with Mr. Ken Penders. Thank you. Yeah, Sonic's been around now for, what, 23 years as a comic book. <laughs> and if you would have told me this when I first started working on the book way back when, I would have thought all of you were insane at that time. It had no idea in our wildest imaginations. Um, when I started the book, there was just the video games uh, and the cartoon series. And as a matter of fact, the, co the comic book was being developed at the same time as the video games and the cartoon series. Uh, Sega was planning a multimedia approach in order to get people interested in the character. So they approached Archie to get the book launched, to come out at the same time as the cartoon and the video game. And the person at the company that was the driving force to get the character launched was not either of the publishers, but the son of one of the publishers, David Silverplatt. And he was the one that was interacting with the licensing firm that was dealing with Sega. And they made a deal. And so the book came to be. And when they were discussing what the comic book would be like, okay, nobody seemed to have a clue how to approach this. So they had several people submit ideas on what the book would be. And it took editor David Daryl Edelman, excuse me, Daryl Edelman, uh, to set the direction for the book yeah. when he hired Scott Shaw and writer Mike Gallagher. And um, basically, they took uh, a combination of the characters from the Saturday morning series with the humor from the weekday series, especially since Mike Gallagher, the writer, his forte was mostly humor. There you go. Okay. That about it? Sorry about that. I'm not used to walking around with a microphone in my hand. <laughs> so this is you know, something new and different for me. Um, so anyway, so Daryl basically scrapped what was to be the first issue and had it totally redone and from there he led the charge with the miniseries the miniseries Soul okay and Scott meanwhile he had uh, he was working in the advertising field as well so because advertising pays a lot better than comic books do you know that's when Scott was replaced with Dave Manning. Okay, so with the miniseries selling like hotcakes, okay, it became, well, you would think it'd be a natural that they're gonna have a regular series. And they started off that way, but they, Archie, for the longest time, the publishers didn't believe that the book would last. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look at the history of licensed comics with any publisher, they really don't have a long track record. There's a handful of titles. There's Conan, there's Transformers, there's G.I. Joe, Star Wars, Star Trek. Okay, Star Wars and Star Trek, their first runs. Okay, Star Trek never made it past issue 80, and Star Wars never made it past issue 107. Look where we are with Sonic today, okay? So the rule is most licensed titles, if they even last a dozen issues, you know, that's amazing. Uh, prior to working on Sonic, for example, I worked on uh, a couple issues of Legends of Zelda based on the Nintendo game. And I was also supposed to work on Defenders of Dinatron City, which was a LucasArts video game. Okay, so at the time I came on board the Sonic book, at that time 
the, nobody had any long-term vision for the book whatsoever. So, writer Mike Gallagher, he was already making plans to move over to Marvel. He was going to be working on Guardians of the Galaxy. I think you might have heard of that title somewhere. So, uh, the co-editor of the book, Scott, I mean, um, Paul Castiglia, excuse me, he was looking for submissions to the Sonic comic. So, my friend, Mike Kanarovich, was friends with Paul. Paul made contact with Mike, said, care to submit. But Mike didn't have a clue who or what a Sonic was. And at the time, um, I had just discovered the Sonic comic and I was picking it up for my son. And I had already purchased the video game, the very first one. So I had a familiarity with the character, but not like a love of it, you know, that my son did. So when Mike told me about what was going on, I said, well, why don't you come out over, we'll toss around a few ideas and we will submit them and uh, see where it goes from there. We submitted three different story ideas, two of which were immediately accepted and they were published in the very first book uh, featuring our work, Sonic uh, the Hedgehog Issue 11. The third story was Sonic, essentially Sonic meeting the Mario Brothers. And uh, Sega flat out put on the paper, rejected. They did not want to see Sonic meet, even in parody form, their arch rival. Nothing. No, no. So, but everything else that we would end up submitting to Sega, it just sailed through. And the thing was, um, we would just pitch story after story. And we had no feedback whatsoever. They didn't tell us what stories to write. They didn't tell us what the characters should be like. The only thing they said was, Sonic is cool and hip. That's it. That's the only direction we were given. You know, he has attitude. You know, and we would be there looking, okay, what, what is the background? What is, what do we have to work with here? Right. Okay. And that's when I began checking out the set, the cartoons. First the weekday, and then the Saturday morning cartoons. And I liked the science fiction adventure aspect of the cartoons. So, I began submitting my story ideas more along with those lines. As, um, at that point then, editor Scott Fulop came out to the book. Because Victor Gorlick was the co-editor with Paul Castiglia, and he felt more comfortable focusing on his Archie comics. And Paul was needed more for promotion. So Scott is brought on. He takes a look around and sees who's doing what on the book and says, I like what these guys are doing. Let's, let's see some more stuff. And we did not have a clue for months until we actually went and visited the Archie offices, you know, for Christmas of 94, no, 93, excuse me, 93. And we're walking into the offices and we're walking past the publishers and we're being introduced to them and the one publisher says, oh, so this is the A team. And we're looking at, huh, what? You know, we didn't have a clue whatsoever. So, and that's how it was. It was a very informal relationship. And we would turn stuff in. Archie in turn would send it to Sega. Their licensing director would go over the material. He'd send back the material with a couple comments. Usually, he wanted to insert more jokes or puns into the material, which would infuriate my, my co-partner at the time, Mike Kanrovich, because Mike, 
that was his forte, the puns and the humor. And he used to go and scratching his head, doesn't he get the joke? You know, so, and me, forget it, humor is not my forte. So, I would, I would plot out the stories, and um, we'd go from there. About the time I did issue 36, okay, Mike was gone at this point. He had just finished co-writing the, uh, the Knuckles miniseries with me. And um, I get a phone call from Scott. And he says, the cartoons are canceled. Okay. And he says, it's, don't expect Sonic to last much longer than this. Really good. And so that's when I pitched the storyline, well, if we're heading towards our last issue, how about we have Sonic's ultimate battle with Dr. Robotnik? And that is how the Endgame saga came to be. Now, the funny thing is, between the time I pitched the Endgame saga and actually had to work on writing the story, okay, uh, several things were happening. One, because there were no more cartoons on the air at the time, uh, fans started discovering our book was very much like the Saturday morning series. So they kept, started picking up the, uh, the book and sales were increasing. And the publishers took note and they said, hmm, do we think we might keep this going a bit longer? So when it came time to start writing the Endgame storyline, uh, the ending originally had uh, Princess Sally killed off. She was not coming back. Sonic had defeated Robotnik. He was dead. Um, and so Justin says, we can't do that. Justin Gabri is now the editor of the book. And he says, we can't do that. We need to keep this book going. I go, okay, <laughs> that's, that's a new one. So we had to revise uh, the ending. And originally issue 50 was also supposed to be a double-sized book. Uh, so I initially wrote that story as a 40-page story. And then I'm told, okay, we have to cut it back because of subscription concerns. And this is how much the business aspect plays in the decision-making process. You know, you gotta take your 40-page story and cut it back to 27 pages. So, you're, you're working on the book and you're rolling with the punches on a month-to-month -month basis. And you're just trying to keep everybody entertained, you're trying to keep them into the storyline, and you have no idea if you're going to be around literally the next month because you are not you are not dependent on uh, Diamond Comics for your sales. Your sales come strictly in supermarkets and the newsstands, okay? And essentially, it, it's dependent upon fans like you to find the book in the most unlikeliest of places and pick it up on a regular basis, you know, in order to support the comic going on. Because Diamond, we were selling, at that time, maybe 6,000, 7,000 copies through the direct distribution market, okay? Whereas through the newsstand, especially from 95 to 98, we were selling like anywhere from 50, 60 to up to 80,000 copies at our peak, something like that. So, so therefore, you guys had really had to go looking if you wanted to find us anywhere. And that was one of the things that we're forever grateful that you guys really liked the work enough that we must have been doing something right that you guys, you know, just hung in there. So here we go. We've got what could have been Sonic's last story. And they said, nope. We're going to keep this going. And then Justin throws me the curveball. 
we're going to do knuckles. Okay. Now you have your pick. You can either do knuckles or you can do Sonic, but you can't do both. Okay. And that was one of the reasons I picked knuckles is because I had a totally blank slate to start with from scratch. You know, from build the character up from the ground floor because he had nothing. Literally had nothing. And I figured, well, if I could make this work, then uh, that would be a good thing. So, and the funny thing happened there is working on the Sonic book, I mean, work, while I was working on Knuckles, they had Mike Gallagher and Carl Bowlers switch off, you know, on the book. And uh, it turned out that the people in the comic shops pay attention to who does the book, which was a total shock to us, as we weren't Marvel, we weren't DC, okay, and uh, we weren't superheroes. And so we didn't think it mattered. But it turned out that without my name on the book, the retailers and the comic book stores cut their orders. So I was requested to submit backup stories to just so they could put my name in the monthly solicitations. And so that's how Justin said, okay, what kind of ideas do you have? Well, how about we do the backup characters? You know, Tales of the Freedom Fighters. We're going to focus on Princess Sally. We're going to focus on Jeffrey St. John. We're going to focus on the secondary characters, you know, so that readers can get to know them a bit better. And so, while I'm doing Knuckles, I'm doing this. The backup characters. And every month it was trying to figure out always uh, what did the fans want to see I would go through email I would go through the letters and you guys would write it and say well what about this character you know where did where are her parents where is where's you know why did this character do what they do okay and it was from there often that I would think, boy, that's not a bad suggestion. Maybe we should explore that aspect of the book and go from there. So, so basically, Sonic has been more or less an adventure, you know, dealing with Sega, trying to keep everything running, and. Um, and it's been, what can I say? It's been, it's been the experience. So much so that after I leave the book, I think I'm off the book, and I'm still getting invited to do DVD covers, to do uh, work on a movie uh, project, and Sonic will be Oh, is that a part of my life here? So, but there's just so much to the history of Sonic that um, I'd rather focus on what you guys are interested. You know, after giving you that brief overview. Here. So, if anybody has any questions here, yes. Um, I actually have two questions. Sure. Um, one is something I've always wondered. The uh, adventure um, translation of the comics got like a five-issue arc. But then when it came time to do Adventure of the Shoe, there was really only one issue that didn't even like focus on okay. Adventure of the Shoe. So I was okay. wondering like, what kind of happened there? Okay. All right. Uh, th it actually was a seven-issue arc. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, it was a seven-issue arc. And that was really interesting. Sega came to us and said, uh, we'd like you to adapt this into a game. I mean, into the comic book, excuse me. And Justin uh, said, well, we need copies of the game. 
you know, because Sega never supplied us with any games upon which to base the stories from. And the only way we even found out any information about Sonic Adventure is one of the artists of the book, Patrick Spaziante, he got a hold of a Japanese edition of the game and played it. And he took notes. And that's what we worked from for those seven issues. A, a basic outline that he constructed. We didn't get anything from Sega. So, so, and initially, the seven issues were to be Knuckles 33 through 35, uh, Sonic uh, 79 through 81, and Super Special 13. But it was just prior to that storyline that the Knuckles book was canceled. Just before we started that storyline. So we had to revamp all those pages that were intended for Knuckles 33 through 35 and work them into, into the Sonic books. So again, that was quite, quite the adventure because there was so much chaos in you know, trying to get through those seven issues because Carl and I would be switching off back and forth who was going to write what. You had all these artists involved and uh, that we even made it through that experience, you know, whole it is amazing in and of itself. Regarding Sonic Adventure 2, we didn't get any information we were going to do Sonic 2, Adventure 2, until the last moment and basically uh, they said well we want you to do this uh, this issue we want you leading up to the game whatever happens in the game but that's all we want we we want this it's more it was more or less a promotion to get you into the game okay and so we were again we were not supplied with any information what the game was like just bare bones here are the characters here's the basic setup i think i had like a one paragraph outline you know to work from to create you know my shadow story how you know shadow gets into you know into the book and um patrick was he was winging it too because uh, Carl was supposed to get him the storyline and Carl was busy meeting other deadlines that Patrick did a lot of the writing until Carl was able to step back in and do a final polish on the script. Okay, And that's all it was. Our relationship with Sega during this time, uh, actually since the very beginning, more or less, is when it came to the games, they never, ever gave us anything of substance to work with, okay? And after the time when the cartoons uh, were taken off the air, for example, and Sonic Adventure 2, okay, there was something called Sonic Underground. How many of you have heard of that one? <laughs> yeah. The director of Sega Licensing at that time called us up and said, we'd like you to incorporate the stories of Sonic Underground into your book, right? And once Justin and I took a look at what would, that would entail, you know, the changes they had in the characters, and so on, right? We said, no, we weren't going to do that because we've already established this continuity, you know. However, if you like, we'd be happy to do a story, you know, one-shot story in the Sonic Super Special book, you know, but we're not gonna, you know, overhaul the comic you know, to accommodate this series here because it had nothing whatsoever uh, to do with the book. 
And that was our approach to everything at that point. Again, with like Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2 and anything else that we adapted during this time frame is how were we going to fit it into the continuity because the games came out on a sporadic basis. There was no animated series. There was nothing, uh, we had no connection with Sonic the Comic. We, we weren't even aware of Sonic the Comic when we were working on the book, you know, the, the UK version. I, I never even saw issues of that until, I think Justin sent me a couple issues back in 2000, 2001. Seriously, didn't even know that existed. I go, what's this? Seriously. Um, and it was at that point in time, too, that I think I started getting contacted by European fans. There was this one girl, um, and I, I hope, she, if, she, if she's paying attention now, I hope she forgives me for forgetting her name, because I, I know I have it somewhere at home, and she was a ter terrific artist. I, I have her stuff bookmarked on my on my browser here, and she would submit samples. And I I was trying at my at the time to get her to work on the Sonic book. But the thing is, because she was in Spain, I couldn't get any cooperation with the people working at Archie to help make it work. So. But, uh, did that answer your question as far as about anybody else? I was going to say, when Justin was working at Sega of America, that didn't alleviate any of the, uh... When Justin was working at Sega of America, he was not the guy in charge. Right. He was the assistant. So, he really didn't have as much authority, say, as he did when he was editing the book. Okay, he, he definitely had more pull. Uh, I, I think in terms of where his power was with the book when he was working at Sega, is we still got away with a lot of stuff that apparently you, you can't right now. Okay? <laughs> and, and here's the thing. I think the book would be a lot better if Sega would just allow the creators who work on the book to do their best stuff and, and drive the narrative more so uh, because, let's face it, the comic comes out on a monthly basis. The games come out, how often do they come out? Anybody here? I mean, what, once a year, twice a year, you know, every two, okay. And if you look at what's going on now in the various media, okay, comic books, are driving, you know, the film industry, the TV industry. Sega has this asset, this 23-year asset of continuity, okay, that, you know, fans have grown up with, okay. If they were to take, and, and we did this, we, uh, my partners and I, back in early 2000s, we actually met with Sega to pitch them the idea of doing a Sonic film based on what we were doing for the Archie series. You know, basically, we were pitching it as, this is Sonic, the beginning. And we were going to establish Sonic with Princess Sally and Tails and the Freedom Fighters and show how Robotnik overran Mobotropolis and basically made the story welcoming for the vast general audience that the character needs in order to grow in today's market. You know, and basically give him the continuity that he needs on a global basis. Okay? In comics, right, you, you talk about Spider-Man, everybody knows Peter Parker, he's bitten by a radioactive spider, and 
he uh, he ends up being responsible for the thief who ends up killing his own Uncle Ben, okay, and having to go after him and discovers that, you know, because he shirked his responsibility, when he could have stopped it, you know, his uncle could have quit. You know, and everybody's familiar with that story that Spider-Man lives with his Aunt May and he fights the Green Goblin and Dr. Octopus. And the same with Superman. Everybody's familiar that Superman is an alien from another planet. He's Clark Kent, works for Daily Planet. You know, Batman is Bruce Wayne, gets in the Batmobile, goes off and fights the Joker. Sonic is not as easy to explain or understand by the general audience, okay? Telling, to, trying to describe somebody, you're, you're dealing with the character with, with an attitude. What does that say? You know, really doesn't say much, okay? So, you, 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 you find yourself, and this is where we were with Sega, that we wanted to base this the movie as if we were re rebooting the comic from day one so that everybody could get on board. And to make it, you know, we were saying, look, you can use whatever assets we created for this movie. Because we, and they were interested at the time. They were really interested and we worked literally for years to get this off the ground, to get what you would call the Archie Sonic version onto the cinema. And unfortunately, the main person who was our champion, and you, and you, and you need a champion in trying to get a project like this, he was licensing director Bob Leffler, Robert Leffler of Sega. And unfortunately, uh, he succumbed to illness and, and, and passed away in 2007. And it, was, it wasn't just a professional blow. It was a personal blow as well because we had established a relationship with, with Robert. You know, that we thought would, would take us a long, you know, keep going for a long time. I mean, to give you an idea how much Sega supported us, for example, I was doing the San Diego Comic Con, and Robert shipped us the actual official Sega Sonic costume for us to have people wear and have the you know pictures taken with and, and signed autographs. So he knew what we were doing with the comics was really important and that it was building you know, the audience there. So, anybody else? Yes? So, is there going to be a Pardon? I, I, is there going to be a Is there going to be a what? Okay. How do I say this? Based on my experiences with uh, trying to get our own movie project off the ground, First of all, do I think it's a viable project? Absolutely. Uh, no, no, no doubt in my head that a Sonic movie is incredibly viable. The problem is, okay, I don't believe Sony is serious about the movie. Okay, I know Sega is. I don't believe Sony is. Okay, and here's the thing. When we were in talks with Sega, and one of the reasons they were considering uh, us to work with them in doing the movie. First of all, one of the, one of my partners uh, is a gentleman who is responsible for getting the X-Men animated series off the ground. He was the primary showrunner for its first five seasons. Okay, so right there was some serious street cred, you know, in our pocket. And when we were talking with the people at Sega, their biggest concern is they had already been licensed by film studios before, okay? But what companies will do in circumstances like this, and this is why I think Sony is not serious about a Sonic movie, is companies will sometimes license a property to bury it so it's not in competition with what they've got planned, okay? Now it's my understanding 
Ratchet and Clank, for example, is a Sony property, is it not? Okay, Ratchet and Clank just came out and went. It was in the theaters, and I, how many of you even saw the movie? Okay, you saw Ratchet and Clank. How many people were in the theater? Not <laughs> My point exactly, my point exactly. Sony saw the returns from Ratchet and Clank, and I think they, you know, first of all, I think either they took Sega off the market so it wouldn't compete with the Ratchet and Clank, or, you know, they're not going to do anything because of Ratchet and Clank. Okay? So I don't think that's going to take off the ground. I'd like to be proven wrong. I would like to be proven wrong. I, I mean, I, I really believe Sonic is a viable entity to keep going, you know, into the future. I think it can, the character uh, can be bigger than ever, but it's going to have to grow beyond just the video game. It has to get an audience to embrace the storyline, the mythology of the character. And that's where the comics are most important in helping the public grab onto that mythology, you know, and understanding of the character, the character's relationships, because that's key. Yes? Um, what advice would you give to someone who is trying to break into comics? Um, what? Pardon? What advice would you give to someone who really wants to get into uh, comics, especially like from the writing? If somebody wants to break into comics? Yeah, especially from the writing. Okay, from the writing point of view. Okay, breaking into comics these days, it's not like when I was breaking into comics. To give you an idea, um, I was submitting samples, Xerox copies of my artwork, okay? And I actually went down, I was living in New England at the time, and I actually took the train down to Manhattan and I had scheduled appointments with editors at Marvel and DC and showed them my portfolio and you know, try and get work from them, okay? And you can't do that in this day and age. You have to be invited, from, it's my understanding. You have to know people, all right? From what I understand, and this, is, this works a lot in this way in Hollywood as well, is you have to establish an online presence as a creator, as a writer, as an artist. If you're just a writer, you're gonna to have to find an artist, okay, to hook up with you, to get your stories out there, okay? And, and basically, you have to build your audience through a webcomic, all right? And the more original you are, the more uh, different you are, the more you're offering some, some that nobody else is offering, the more likely it is you're going to attract an audience. But you have to be regular, you have to be dependable, because you know people want to see it. And you have to promote yourself as well. You know, can't stress the social media aspect enough. Okay, you definitely have to make people aware because even, and this was the amazing thing I saw on the news the other day, you know, because I was, I, I followed the presidential election religiously, okay, and they were talking about the hardest thing today in this day and age is getting people's attention for anything, okay, whether it's a TV program a film, an election, okay, whatever the, whatever it is, there's too much competing for your attention every single minute of every single day, you know, what, your job, your family, you're, you're being pulled in how many different directions, so to get you to take time even five minutes to watch a video or to read a, or, you know, 15, 20 minutes to read a comic book. That's a major accomplishment. It really is. You know, so when you go to your newsstand and you pluck down your money 
for a comic book, that's a sincere statement that whatever these people are doing, that interests you. You consider it worth it. That's why buying it, paying for the comic or the video, what have you, matters, okay? Because that is what gives the creators the incentive to do the work. Yes, you can do it for the luck getting started, but at a certain point, you are going to want to pay the bills, okay? You're, you're, it's just a fact of life, okay? And if, you're, and if your favorite creators are not supported, okay, and nobody's saying Taj Mahal or, you know, limos and that, all this stuff, just, just basically pay the bills. They will keep going. Okay, so when you when you do your comic book or your online comic, and you're able to monetize it, that's when you know you have arrived. That people are willing to pay you for what you do. Okay, I mean Sonic. People bought the book. It's still here. It matters. They're willing to pay for it. Okay, without you guys willing to support the book on a financial level, it's not going to be here. Archie will cancel it tomorrow. Sega won't get a dime. Okay, it moves on. Same with the video games. If people don't buy the video games, they're not going to do Sim simple math. Yes? Uh, I have a question. You mentioned the webcomic. Yes. Suppose somebody wants to do a webcomic based on Pardon? Somebody wants to do a Somebody wants to do a fan comic based on Okay. All right. Let's get into that topic a little bit here. Um, fan comics have been done on a number of properties. People done Star Trek fan comics. They have done Sonic uh, fan fan comics. Uh, you may have heard about a little thing that occurred with me with regards to Archie over copyrights, okay? Technically speaking, we're entering into a different era right now. It's, it's not obvious yet, okay? But the major companies are going to start cracking down because they're going to be required by the courts to protect their intellectual property, okay? I just recently read on the website bleedingcool.com. There was an article by an, uh, a copyright attorney, and he was basically talking about Artist Alley. And he was saying, like, he's walking down Artist Alley, and here's all these creators, all these artists, they're essentially doing drawings of copyrighted and trademark characters, okay? Now, unless they have a license from Marvel or DC or whoever to do these, these works, okay, they're essentially breaking the law, okay? And Paramount just recently, for example, went after a Star Trek fan project. I think it was something called Star Trek X and Hour. I'm not sh quite sure. I, I know vaguely some of the details, but these, if I, if I understand correctly, it was like a series of Star Trek films. This is like the fifth or sixth, where the fans funded everything out of their pockets to make these things. They didn't charge a dime for you to watch them. But because Paramount is coming out with a Star Trek movie, this summer, and you have this fan-made project, okay, in order to protect their interests, you know, Paramount apparently had to step in and actually go after these guys. Okay? I am not quite sure what the outcome is, okay, so I can't speak with any authority what was said there, okay, but I do know you know, the day is, is approaching where you say to yourself, well, it's free, you know, I'm not doing anything, who am I hurting? 
you know, it's online, who can stop me? Um, those are all valid questions. But the thing is, you don't know if you're gonna end up being the test case for, for you know, for some company that says this far, no further, let's make an example of this person. So I can't, in all good conscience, say to you, go off and do your Sonic fan comic, have fun, okay? What I can do, okay, and because these are my characters, okay? I mean, I created Jeffrey St. John, I created Lara Sue, I created, you know, all these, Rob of the Hedge and all these other characters. I can say, fine, you want to do fan art or fan story? It's fine with me, but all I ask in return is you say, the character is copyrighted and trademarked in my name, okay? That's all I ask, is, is that the credit, that it's recognized, okay? I am not, these are my characters, I'm not trying to discourage anyone, okay? I appreciate the fans. I, 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 I welcome their interest, okay? But I can only say it with regards to my characters. I can't say, go off and do Sonic or Knuckles, okay? I don't own them, okay? Just like I can't say, go off and go do a Star Trek comic, okay? Can't do that, you know? And, and, and in any event, because of the way things are going, okay, you stand a better chance creating your own property, making your own mark, okay, establishing your own reputation, okay, have the people come to you, okay, I mean, you want to start out with the fan stories, that's fine, but you really should strive for more, because, you know, you work for a company, you will not have creator ownership, you will not have creator uh, control, okay? You will be dictated to, you will be told, I need this character to fight this villain in this issue, you know, and it's gonna tie in for this toy merchandise, or I need you to tie in with, you know, this publishing event, you know, and you don't have much, much say. Exactly. I mean, that's where the future lies. You, you guys have the means to get your work out to so many people that we never did when we were, when we were kids. Okay. I mean, for us to publish a com a full color comic. Back then, you, when Eastman and Laird came out with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the first issue, they had to borrow from their uncle something like $2,500 to do a print run of like maybe five, 6,000 copies. And it was all black and white. And I think the cover was just one color besides black. Okay? And that's all they could, could afford. And it was only through the sales of that issue, they were able to keep going, and it wasn't until they actually got a licensing deal that the whole thing exploded for them. Okay, somebody saw the potential in their characters to become fan favorites with kids, you know, toys, t-shirts, you know. I mean, look at, what, there's a five movies now? You know, so I mean, you don't know. If you were to say, 35 years ago, this is where Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was going to end up. Again, people would tell you you were crazy. You know, so you don't know where these things are going to end up. Okay? But you need to try if you if you hope to have any level of success. Okay? Anybody else? Yes. I know you mentioned earlier that in 2000 you proposed a film idea to Sega yes. in regards to 
the origins of Sonic? That's what, yeah, 2003 we, we proposed that film, yes. Yes, I'm curious, uh, what is your opinion on how Sonic should start his adventure in terms of why Sonic is, how Sonic got his speed and why is he, why does he want to protect nature against pollution and the rise of machines and like how he first met Dr. Eggman? Those were questions we were working to answer in the first film. How did Sonic get his speed um, and, and, and so on? Um, what, I, I, I would not use the word mutant. Um, we were thinking of something along the lines uh, that had to do with, um, with his shoes. You know, whether we were trying to decide whether they were protective gear because he was so fast or if they were the source of his speed. We, we hadn't quite, because we hadn't uh, worked out all the story beats, we were just trying to give a rough idea to Sega where we would go with the story. That here we're starting off with, with everyone as kids. You know, and you'd see the parents, and you'd see the takeover of Mobotropolis, and you would see the parents get roboticized, and you were going to be made aware of the loss these characters suffered and what they had to fight for, you know. And that's where we were going to... That, that was essentially the basis for the first film. Get everybody on the same page with the character. Just like Superman the movie gets you on the same page for that character, Batman Begins, that character, and so on. The origin film. Which Sonic really never has had. Yes? Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming out here. I really appreciate uh, your interest. And if you have any other questions, I will be back at my table and willing to answer any and everything. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ken Benders. is coming up pretty soon. Okay, I'll just check. Yeah, okay. Um, coming up in five minutes, stick around. It's going to be our Battle of the Artists competition, and that's going to involve our guest artists that are here. And after that, it's going to be our raffle that everybody's been asking about. <laughs> okay, I need to get.